Uh, we, we've uh, put together a lineup for this uh, portion of the meeting of uh, a variety of different individuals that have interacted with uh, uh, John over the years, and um, so they, they all have some nice things to say. So the first person that I'll um, have up is uh, Bruce Gantz. It's really with great sadness I'm standing here today to talk about the influence that John Naparco has had on cochlear implant research and development. I first met John about 25 years ago when I was a visiting professor at the University of Michigan. John was a disciple of John Kemick, who was a good friend of mine. And uh, we met and we really sort of bonded at that time. Uh, John was a new professor, uh, an assistant professor, and he had just gotten a grant from the NIDCD at that time uh, to study uh, the influence of uh, uh, the cochlear implant or electrical stimulation on the uh, central nervous system. Uh, John and I uh, became very good friends and colleagues, and he really uh, helped our center quite a bit. Uh, John was an external reviewer for our uh, cochlear implant Clinical Research Center for about the past 15 years, and really got to enjoy his very critical, challenging nature. And he, he had the ability to make comments that made us better. He, his his uh, uh, eye uh, for what he thought was important uh, was extended into our research uh, on many fronts. In fact, uh, he was involved in our competitive renewal that we are going to be handing in at the end of this month uh, to the NIH, and he, we had sent him some material. Uh, he apologized that he couldn't be in, be in Iowa City, but on May 11th, he, he was on, or excuse me, April 11th, uh, he was on the, the uh, phone with us and he had reviewed our grant and the four projects, and he made some extremely important uh, decisions with us that really, I think, will help us in, in the future. It was typical of John, who gave everything he had when he was involved in a project. And I just learned about two weeks after that, that he had died. It was just unbelievable that we didn't even know that he was that ill. He had told me before that he couldn't come to Iowa City because he was involved in a clinical trial for a new drug for his disorder, but it was a shock to all of us when uh, we found out he had died. So I said John's initial research was involved with uh, looking at the neuroanatomy and the influence of electrical stimulation on the central uh, brainstem in deaf white cats. And uh, he was rewarded uh, with a, a clinical investigator development award <clears throat> from the NIDCD for this work for five years. One of the more important contributions, however, what John made was his foray into the cost utility and the cost effectiveness of cochlear implants. And when he was at Hopkins, he got the epidemiologic uh, center there to help with uh, looking at the effect of cochlear implants and what was the, co the cost utility and effectiveness in the United States. And his landmark article in 1996 in JAMA really helped propel our efforts with third party payers and the government because he set a standard. He went in, that group went ahead and then studied the cost effectiveness of cochlear implants in children, which again helped us uh, move things forward. More recently, he was leading a multi-institutional multi study for the NIH that involved six centers around the United States and 62 investigators. And this, the focus of this research was to study and address the complexity of language development under conditions of restored addition in the very young child, 
And I will tell you that this has been a, an extremely productive group with multiple publications uh, that have been published in, in our best journals. John had another influence on cochlear implant development and research as editor of otology, neurotology, and he, has been, he was editor for the past 10 years. And they, he was just about to step down from that, and that organization was looking for a new editor. But John's contributions and the influence he had was extremely significant to us as uh, cochlear implant researchers. Also under his leadership at um, Hopkins, he developed the Listening Center, which became one of the largest of its kind in the United States. And this work uh, really was advocating an improved access to cochlear implant technologies and mainstream educational opportunities for the deaf and hard of hearing. And that was really one of the real loves of his life. In 2013, he moved to USC and became a, uh, the professor and head of the Keck School of Medicine at uh, the University of Southern California. Uh, and there, in their website, in the eulogy for John, they felt his leadership was extremely transformative in the very uh, beginning of the formation of that uh, department and elevation of that department. John was a co-author of more than 200 professional papers and abstracts and reviews. And in, to sum it all up, John Naparco was really a force in otology, neurotology. He was an innovative and an extremely critical thinker. The cochlear implant community will miss his championing, championing and supportive work for the deaf and the hard of hearing. Unfortunately, he was taken away from us way too soon. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Terry Zwollen. So I'm, I'm saddened also, yet honored, to be part of this tribute to my friend and colleague, John Naparco. I first met John in 1990 when um, I joined the CI program at the University of Michigan. And for those of you who may not know, John did his bachelor's degree, his medical degree, his residency, and then returned to be a faculty member for a while at U of M, and that's where I first uh, met John. It goes without saying that he was a sincerely proud Wolverine. He loved to yell, go blue, all the time, as we do when we're in Ann Arbor. Um, one of his great accomplishments that I'd love to talk to you about today is, is the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. And in 2009, John and I um, talked about a, a group, establishing a group um, of professionals who could work together to prioritize and address the needs of patients with cochlear implants. And we knew it would be different because it wouldn't focus on a single profession. It wouldn't be just a group of surgeons or just a group of audiologists. But its, its strength would lie in the collaborative efforts of, of people who work in implant programs today because it's such a team-based approach. Well, now that's no small task to start a new organization. And we were really kind of worried that people would say, why should I join one more organization? Um, and we were both fearful about that. But in all honesty, John was very smart, and he had a lot of friends. So all he had to do was call a couple of his friends, and we had a group get together in 2010, a group of professionals that included not just surgeons, but audiologists, speech pathologists, educators, as well as representatives of the cochlear implant manufacturers. And we discussed the initiation of such an organization, and that group confirmed that, yes, indeed, it was time for, for such an organization to start. About one year later, in 2011, the American Cochlear Implant Alliance was established. The board of directors was elected and consisted of professionals who work in the area of cochlear implantation, as well as those personally touched with hearing loss. John's group at Hopkins that year, although it was very early after establishment, um, hosted CI 2011, and they graciously donated some of the proceedings from their meeting to the American Cochlear Implant Alliance, which really set a precedent for ACIA's involvement in future CI meetings. One last 
thing that John did um, as part of ACIA is he was instrumental uh, in our CMS study. He was an instrumental part of the MedCAC meeting that was held in 2011. And the purpose of that meeting was to convince CMS or to discuss it with them about expansion of current criteria. The meeting was good. There was a lot of information presented, but at the end, they denied expansion of coverage. But they did agree to let ACIA conduct a study to look at expansion. John served as one of the principal investigators on that study, which is still ongoing today. And many of us are hopeful that when that study is completed, many more CMS beneficiaries will be able to benefit from cochlear implants. So during today's meeting, you heard from Donna about the recent accomplishments of the ACIA. You as members should be all very proud of these accomplishments, and we should all be very proud of John, the man with a lot of friends who envisioned what we have today. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, next, Charles Lim. So I think I knew John in a different way than a lot of you did because I trained with him. And so my relationship sort of evolved the way it does with your father. Um, and to me, he was not um, John at first. He was uh, Dr. Naparco. He was a name that I, I revered and feared at the same time. <laughs> And it was actually, he became JKN to me, okay? And so John was JKN. And for years, I had the privilege of first being his resident, so he took me under his wing in 1996. Uh, then I was his fellow, and then I was his colleague, and then finally I was his friend. And so over the course of about a 20-year relationship, I got to understand this man, this complicated man. I mean, John's very complicated. And I, I start to understand the wisdom of his ways and the things he said over a very, it's like slowly revealing itself to me over the years. And I can tell you that I'm completely indebted to him and there's absolutely no way I would have become an otologist had it not been for him. Now, um, it, John was undoubtedly a great man, but also undoubtedly not that easy to work for. And that's actually one of the defining attributes that I think of when I think of him, is that he was difficult. And he was difficult not because he didn't like you or me. He was difficult because he wanted excellence out of everyone, every single person around him, the entire institution. He demanded excellence. And he wouldn't let you slip. And he'd let you know it if you did. And so as a result, he really demanded a higher gear of yourself. And I think he's really led me to understand what it meant to try to be great. Even knowing that we're flawed, you try to be great. Now, partly because he called me Chaz, and nobody had ever done that before, I hear his voice echoing in my head all the time, because he would say things to me with that voice you know, that I would never quite understand. And um, so I had another name for him, which was the Riddler, because John was kind of like the Sphinx. You know, the long, he sort of spoke in riddles and little haikus at times, and those, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so it'd be like, you know, John, what approach do you think we should take for this tumor? He's like, mm hmm good Chaz, yes. <laughs> and then he'd walk away. And I'd be like, did we just have an exchange about surgery? And then later I realized, you know what? I think we did. I think that was sufficient, just for him to acknowledge that I needed to understand that we needed to know the approach. It was, it was sufficient. <laughs> and then I noticed that he did this thing in the OR that I think the trainees, the residents that are here, found really kind of uh, can drive you crazy, but he would use the soft trailing voice. He had a very soothing voice, but in the OR, it was sometimes off-putting, because he'd be like, okay, Chaz, now I want you to take the drill. I want you to... <laughs> now, as a trainee, you have no idea what he just said. You're trying to guess, what could he possibly have said? And then you're either going to do something that he's going to tell you immediately not to do, or you're going to ask him to repeat himself, neither of which is a good option. And so it kind of puts you in a bad situation. Now, over the years, I can tell you, he was the hardest working person I knew in the hospital. Okay? Absolutely tireless. Anytime I thought I was working hard, I would look, and there he would be working twice as hard. If I sent an email at 1 a.m., I'd get one back at 2 a.m. If I woke up at 6 a.m., I'd get an email from him in my inbox at 5 a.m. Never without fail, he would always be working. He was always at the hospital, and you know, through that, as a resident, I learned to operate. As a fellow, I learned to think. And as a faculty member, I learned how to demand excellence of myself and of my colleagues. Now, he also multitasked like you wouldn't believe. We once had an entire meeting in his office while he was lifting free weights, <laughs> doing bicep curls because he needed to get his workout in in the middle of the day. And then on rounds, because he hadn't done his uh, cardio, we would walk nine flights up the stairs to see our post-op 
patients, both of us would be completely winded by the time we got to the patient. The patient must have been looking like, why are you guys all breathing so heavily? And so his is the voice that I will always hear during surgery and in, I think for the rest of my career. You know, usually at Hopkins, this venerable institution is what makes people great. But I think in the case of John, John is what made Johns Hopkins Otolaryngology great. And he is the one that really made us great. And he made the listing center superlative. And, you know, John, wherever you are, I'm forever indebted to you. All of us here are. And I think that we will remember you fondly, gratefully, but for now, painfully. Thank you. Thanks, Chaz. <laughs> that actually answers a lot of questions for me. <laughs> I had some tough nights on the phone with John. <laughs> so the next speaker will be Nancy Mellon. Okay, I have some photos for you that I'm gonna try to find. Not that one. Here's where I start. John got into selfies in his later years, but he sent pictures before then. <laughs> Um, among patients and families, John was known for his kindness, his gentle manner, his warmth, his humility, and his willingness to go out of his way for people. He gave patients his cell phone number, he made house calls, he, like a physician from an earlier era, he was always just a phone call away for anxious patients and families. Um, I know John through the work we did together over 23 years, starting in 1993, when I brought this guy up to Johns Hopkins for CI candidacy. And the surgery and activation went really well. And um, I turned to John and I said, so now what? Okay, so newly implanted kid, 1994, what do we do? Um, what we did was uh, create the listening center. And uh, John had asked me to meet for coffee. He said, we need to raise money. Uh, if we want rehab pe people in a medical institution, we need to um, raise some money. So um, we created Identity, the listening center, and we developed a logo, named ourselves, raised a few million dollars, and hired rehab people at Johns Hopkins. We called the program the Listening Center because we thought we were gonna be helping kids listen, but John was the listener in chief. Um, in 2000, I think that says 2000, we published the cost utility study with Andre Chang, and um, that year the book, um, the cochlear implant book was also published. Um, the book included sections on maternal sensitivity, attachment, parental response to diagnosis. John had listened to the parents um, at the Sunday support group meetings that we started at Johns Hopkins. Um, that was an enormous commitment for someone with the work ethic that he had to show up one Sunday a month and sit with parents who were grieving about diagnosis and walking through that whole process. Um, he always understood that the surgery was only the beginning of the journey. <laughs> In 1998, we became interested in the educational settings in which children were using their cochlear implants, and we raised the money to start a school in Washington, D.C. Um, in September 1999, we bought a building. This is a weird shot of the River School, but <laughs> there it is. And we began to try to develop a program that would optimize cochlear implant outcomes. When John visited the River School, um, which he did frequently. It was hard to move through the halls with him. He was our rock star. The kids knew him, and so did their parents and the teachers. And he really inspired fierce loyalty among all the people who knew him. I'm noting that being at this conference, um, that every person I see that knew John has a story to share, and all of you sitting there are people that are familiar because of your relationship with John. Um, colleagues sometimes described John as a driven man, um, but he made time for the things he cared about. He showed up. He was there every year for the River School Scholarship Auction. He spoke to our parent groups and attended the speaker series. He was present at a high school patient's um, high school presentation. I mean, it was amazing that he would show up for these things. His education interest was lifelong. When he traveled internationally, he would often visit schools and he always sent me pictures. So here's some from, I believe, China. 
Um, and he came by his interest in education and children naturally. His mother, Ann Barson Nicoparco, was an artist and special educator who worked with children who struggled to speak and to walk. And I think his great reserves of empathy may have developed through his relationship with the students that his mom brought home for art lessons. Um, he talked about that a lot when we talked about education. Um, he built very strong relationships and adoring relationships with his patients and their families. In LA, he uh, sort of semi-adopted one of his patients who turned out to have cancer like him, and he would send pictures as they progressed um, through treatment. So John talked a lot about the role of the motivated mom, even before the national study identified in maternal sensitivity as a powerful predictor of CI outcomes. I had the privilege of being one of those moms, and it changed my life. Um, in the outpouring of love and sympathy from the River School community following John's death, there was one note that I think put it simply but well. It read, a giant has passed, and I think that's right. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Our next speaker is uh, Donna Sorkin. I think most people in this room knew John through his work as a surgeon, a scientist, or an educator. I'm going to share my perspective about him in a different capacity, one that was related to his efforts to promote consumer empowerment and cochlear implants in the larger world. I met John in 1992 when I came to Johns Hopkins to be evaluated for a cochlear implant. He was 37, though he looked much younger, and I wondered if he was experienced enough to carry out this important surgery for me. It didn't take long to realize how extraordinarily committed he was to patient care and addressing deafness in broad terms. He had an intuitive sense of the importance of rehabilitation, the family, and the role that hearing played in human connection across the age spectrum. We became friends and collaborators. I had been selected to be the next executive director of the National Organization for Adults with Hearing Loss. The organization had not been very promotional of cochlear implants, even though many of its members were candidates. John immediately saw the benefit of being involved to provide information and also to empower people to be effective advocates for themselves and for public policy. As is sometimes the case, the stars had lined up for us. The organization's upcoming annual conference was scheduled to be in Baltimore, just a few miles from Johns Hopkins. John wanted to involve consumers in broader discussions about research and public policy. And he saw that providing brief summaries on research would not lead to meaningful engagement, but rather what was needed was detailed content in a way that was understandable to an audience of non-scientists, such as that undertaken on NOVA or National Geographic. It had never been done before, not by NIH, nor by any other institution. John applied his considerable charm and powers of persuasion to convince researchers from Johns Hopkins and other institutions to participate in the first ever consumer research symposium given by leading scientists. He worked directly with the speakers to ensure that their talks were appropriate for this audience. It was a gamble. My own staff didn't think that consumers would be interested, and they balked at making it a plenary session. In fact, the entire convention was in the research symposium, and no one left for four hours for fear of losing their seat. The positive response led to annual research symposia at consumer conferences and enhanced written content, and it was that theme of empowering consumers with information that John had an extraordinary appreciation for. 
He knew that only a small segment of people who could benefit knew about cochlear implants. And reaching that larger population became a persistent theme for him. He helped to shape a special cochlear implant issue which encouraged people to explore their candidacy or tell others about CI. He joined the board of directors of Hearing Loss Association of America and was a valuable and active member helping to carve out new approaches to empower consumers and impact public attitudes. He never put himself on the physician pedestal, not with his patients, nor with this larger group of consumers that he interacted with. Rather, he recognized that putting the person in charge would lead to better outcomes. Patients loved Dr. Naparco because he was far more than a surgeon. He was involved in their lives. He went on the journey with you. And in the case of Jacob Landis, John literally joined Jacob's ride on part of a cross-country bike trip to raise awareness for cochlear implants. John understood that cochlear implant recipients who were in the public eye could be tremendously helpful. And when Heather Whitestone McCollum, the first Miss America with a disability, showed up in his clinic in 2002, he recognized how important she could be to raising awareness and affecting public policy. At his encouragement, Heather made herself available to visit with the Secretary of Health and Human Services, our highest ranking health official in the United States. The former Miss America showed off her CI. And that year, the government made major changes in hospital reimbursement for older adults. Starting in the mid-1990s, he conducted research on quality of life and cost effectiveness, which was instrumental in obtaining insurance coverage in this country. His proximity to Washington, D.C. was fortuitous. Dr. Naparco was skillful at explaining benefit to federal officials, and he devoted extraordinary effort to improving national policies on cochlear implants. Congressman David McKinley is the only member of Congress with a cochlear implant. John encouraged him as a patient and a friend to lend his perspective. The congressman now chairs the Congressional Hearing Health Caucus and was a crucial ally as we sought to retain insurance coverage of bone anchored implants for older adults. When John moved to California, he continued his involvement with public policy. And here he is with the ACI Alliance Board of Directors visiting with staff from the US Senate Education Committee. Those of us who were fortunate enough to know him marveled at his energy and the breadth of his interests in our field, interests that went well beyond being a superlative surgeon and scientist to truly emphasizing the power of human connection. Thanks, Donna. Thank Thank you all, really, for those, uh, those beautiful words. Um, as we all know, there are many, uh, many people that have heavily impacted the field of, of cochlear implantation. And after much discussion amongst the board, um, we have chosen to further recognize John's uh, contributions because of his impact specifically on the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. Um, you, uh, there are cards that exist out there um, hopefully they've passed those out. Uh, what we've decided to do is establish a memorial lecture for John. Uh, and um, what we're offering is an opportunity for you to contribute to this, this memorial lectureship. It'll be a lecture that occurs each year at the uh, ACI Alliance uh, meeting. And uh, you can have an opportunity to, to uh, contribute to that lectureship if you so choose. Uh, yeah. So you see here that this is uh, um, there's uh, you'll see the 
the uh, tenants of the memorial lectureship here. And as, as, uh, as you see, it'll be called the John Naparco Lectureship. Uh, we'll select it uh, each year based on a variety of factors, but uh, we'll select a, a keynote uh, speaker, and that speaker will be uh, termed the John Naparco Lecture. You can see the rest of it there. So we're really uh, proud of this. We think it'll be a nice way to memorialize John and remember his contributions. So uh, with that, I think that's all we have uh, for the meeting today. Um, thank you all for coming. So thanks.